And what is the sentiment under Trump for IPOs? You know, there is a renewed sense of optimism in the United States. The market conditions are right for IPOs. You have low and steady volatility, low and steady interest rates. You have asset prices and indexes flirting with record highs. And you have a commitment from the administration to have meaningful corporate tax reform, a review of the regulatory environment in the United States. So the conditions are right. There's a strong IPO appetite in the United States. Because it was pretty low volumes in 2016. So you are expecting markedly higher volumes for this year, right? You know, if we take a step back and go beyond 2016, take a step back to 2014, record year for IPOs in the United States. On the New York Stock Exchange alone, we raised over $60 billion in capital with 128 IPOs. 2015 was shaping up to be another very strong year for the New York Stock Exchange. But if you remember some of the macroeconomic events that took place, including the surprise devaluation of the Chinese RMB, kicked off a wave of volatility that rippled across asset classes and geographies. Carried over into 2016, we had Brexit, we had the U.S. election. And now that we're through all that and market con conditions are right, we're seeing the IPO window reopen. And if Trump isn't able to execute on his plans, how much of an effect is that going to be? How much of drag will that be on IPO sentiment? You know, that's part of it. But also, we're encouraged by the reforms taking place at, of all places, our regulator, the SEC. Jay Clayton, the incoming chairman of the SEC, made it very clear during his confirmation hearing that one of his priorities, one of the pillars of his platform at the SEC, is going to be capital raising and capital formation. So it is on the agenda of the administration. You know, if you would have told me a year ago that the energy sector would have been one of the hottest sectors for IPOs in the first quarter, I would have said you're crazy. But in 2017, with oil prices reducing, Bounding quite a bit. We saw a lot of energy companies come to market. We've also had a lot of great technology companies come to market as well. One big energy company, of course, is Saudi Aramco, <laughs> potentially the largest listing that we've ever seen. We know that Hong Kong is potentially flirting with them, as is Tokyo, London, all in the mix. What are you doing to lure Saudi Aramco? Well, as you know, I obviously can't address any specific company. But what I can say is if there's a company out there that's considering going public, you should assume we're talking to them. But generally speaking, in that space, if you look at the deepest pool of liquidity, the market that can absorb an IPO of that size that you're referencing, it's the United States. It's the New York Stock Exchange. We also have the broadest pool uh, of liquidity and listed companies from that energy space as well. So while I'm sure exchanges around the world are competing for that listing, um, when it comes to those type of uh, companies and markets, the New York Stock Exchange is the best one out there. What more do you need to do? It is a competitive space. What more do you need to do to attract those listings, particularly from companies that want to get Asian investors on board? Well, I'm glad you asked that. If you look at all of the large companies, all the large global companies, they choose to list on the New York Stock Exchange. They choose to do it for several reasons, because they know their IPO is going to be flawlessly executed. They want to be traded and listed among their peers. That's 87% of the Dow, 77% of the S&P 500 are listed with us. So if you look back over the past three years at every large IPO, and the rule of thumb in our industry is about $700 million capital raise and above, 29 in a row of those operating companies have listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So we're we're doing the right things. But there's more you can do, right? There are more measures you can take to, to, to increase your attractiveness. Uh, we'll continue to, and we'll continue to advocate down in Washington for public companies, because it is difficult to be a public company. There is a lot of scrutiny and a lot of regulation that comes along with it. And we want to make sure that we, as the New York Stock Exchange and the United States Capital Markets, are putting out the welcome mat to not only domestic issuers, but international issuers as well. So we're going to continue to advocate in Washington with the SEC and with other key policymakers. You've been meeting with clients, or potential clients, potential Chinese clients. What is the appetite from Chinese private companies for listings on the NYSE? It's strong. I mean, if you go back to last year, we had only a handful of listings, given, you know, obviously the IPO climate in the United States and globally. But we had a handful of listings from China, including the largest international IPO on the New York Stock Exchange last year came from China. And also one of the other largest transactions, Young China, listing on the New York Stock Exchange last year. The pipeline this year is even stronger. We've had a couple of companies from China already list. We had uh, uh, Bright Scholar, an online education company in China Rapid Finance finance as well. And the pipeline's strong for the rest of 2017, and it's really strong for 2018 if all the market conditions hold, hold steady. Well, we were just talking in the break about some of the sectors where there is the most interest. And you talked about education. Give us a bit more details on that and other sectors where, here in China, that are particularly interested in listing 
in the U.S. No, you'd be surprised. There's a great mix of industries that are that are looking to, to raise capital on the New York Stock Exchange and in the United States. I mentioned education. Online education is a very, very big industry. Private schools are a big, very big, um, very big market for us as well. Online lending and a lot of financial institutions are interested in raising capital. And then the rest of the pipeline is spread out across all the other industries. So it's very strong, though. And in terms of reforms of the capital market here. The NYSE has been involved working with the PBOC for more than three decades. Where would you say we're at in terms of the reform picture? What more needs to be done here in China to open up those capital markets? No, great question. And it's actually been more than three decades. So we actually floated some bonds for the Chinese government over a century ago to help fund the construction of the railroads in Hunan province. But the relationship really took off, as you stated, in earnest about 31 years ago when we met with Deng Xiaoping and launched a financial market symposium. Since that time, we've worked closely with the exchanges in China, the Shanghai Exchange, Shenzhen Exchange, Dalian Commodities Exchange, and other municipalities and provinces to really help them foster the capital markets uh, throughout the country here. So we're, we're in active dialogue with the country. The New York Stock Exchange turned 225 years old just last week. The markets here are about 25 years old. So they've done a lot in those 25 years compared to how long it's taken us to get where we are. Do you think there's still lessons to be learned, though? Because, of course, we had that market crash and they were putting stops in and they, they bodged it, essentially. And there's still lessons to be learned, right? Well, markets are going to continue to evolve. Regulation is going to continue to evolve. And we're here to be a resource uh, to not only, not only the Chinese, but other countries around the world to learn from our experiences over those 225 years. And they're working on an IPO rule as well, which was being delayed, I think. They were working on it. They're hoping to have that rolled out later this year. It's been sidelined. But maybe that's an area they can they can push forward on as well. Oh, no, the CSRC, the China Securities Regulatory Commission, is working on a lot of reforms. There's a strong backlog of, of companies set to set to go public here in China. You're seeing that backlog ease a little bit, and we're we're optimistic about what's happening. But does that here. backlog help you? Because that means they may be more attractive attracted to listening in in the uh, New York Stock Exchange or on the New York Stock Exchange because there is such a long waiting list here. Charlie. <laughs> it can be. I think last year there were something like 600 companies in the backlog. So maybe some of those will look to uh, look to raise capital internationally, but most of those are seeking to raise capital in China. We talk about consolidation in the sector as well, yeah. because of course the London Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, that was blocked, that deal. But Credit Suisse and others have said, look, consolidation is going to happen in the sector. What are your views? You know, if you take a step back, so there have been two great waves of consolidation within the exchange industry. One was in 2007, where the New York Stock Exchange got together with several other exchanges. You saw a lot of the regional exchanges come together, and those were all successful, uh, successful transactions. The second wave was in 2011, when the New York Stock Exchange tried to get together, together with Deutsche Börse. London and Toronto tried to get together. Singapore and Australia tried to get together. And all of those deals were prohibited for various reasons. Now we've seen another wave of consolidation flare up. You saw that deal you mentioned uh, be prohibited and, and, and fall apart. But there may be some opportunities for consolidation within the space. Time will tell what, what, those, uh, what those markets will be.